That brought his laugh. Okay, so you have to work at the lesson uh, from today. That was just a learning lab. Um, we decided to give you an assignment, please and me. So um, this is going to be a little fun activity tonight that we can pretend to throughout the whole course in thinking about what it is that we're seeing in the water. So we're going to talk about um, an Indian the And so I'm going to, I'll give you a little intro about the Kosai bot and then about but before I forget, I got a message from security on campus that apparently every time a door is propped open, they get an alarm. <laughs> so they were like, what about this building? What about that building? And who's going to open? So I think I've got, you know, Chris can keep his door open because it's really hot in the kitchen. And he should be keeping that open while he's cooking. But we can't prop any of the doors that go outside. I know, it's a pain in that. I wear this all the time, and it's just so irritating. Um, so you got to take it with you. Don't prop the outside doors open on the dorms. Don't prop these open. Um, I think that Patrick and Charlotte have a key to everybody's room. So if you lock yourself out of the room, they will get you back in your room. And I'm sorry, it's such a hassle, but it is because we allow it. We're very impressed. It hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we can't pop the outside doors open in that building either. But I, I told them that we needed to leave the lab for fully. Anyway, let me know if it's a hassle. I'll do my best to go back and forth between us and campus. So, um, how many people have heard of an imaging plus side bot or an IFCB? Okay, a couple people here. Okay, excellent. Um, I happen to have one down in the lab here, so we're going to be looking at it. So I'm going to tell you that Ivana is going to give you a really um, uh, much more informative lecture about phytoplankton and insects. Oh, Sasha, you gave it to Sasha. Okay, Sasha. Sasha will give it to But if you want to know anything about phytoplankton, Ivana, your go to gal. Um, so phytoplankton from the Greek, um, um, phyton meaning plant, and um, planktos meaning wanderer or drifter. And so what that means is, of course, that phytoplankton are small and they can't fight away, fight their way across the current the way a fish can. Um, they're photosynthetic, so they absorb light with pigments and they use that light. And that means that they're going to have really, really distinct and unique absorption properties. So optically, it's the pigments that make them really super interesting. So they are at the whim of currents. Um, but I would just note that some phytoplankton can regulate their depth, either um, by changing their buoyancy, or some have flagella that they can swim. And in fact, right now I'm involved in a study at a bay that's like a little bit beyond this bay, where the water gets really stratified. And we're seeing dinoflagellates migrate up during the day to photosynthesize and down at night to get nutrients. But the water's down deep are very acidic, so they don't spend a ton of time down there. So we're looking at how they're regulating um, their ability to get nutrients but not be in too acidic of water. And so we're comparing two sites. So anyway, they're photosynthetic, but they move around. So it would kind of be like if the tree was like, well, I don't like this area. Orange over here and go somewhere else. These phytoplankton are amazing. They figure out where they want to be. Um, they are single cell, but they can form chains. Um, they are in a size range um, relative to the wavelength of light. So as we start to think about what the scattering properties are, it makes a difference if it's a tiny phytoplankton versus like a really giant diet. They're going to scatter like really differently. Wayne's going to talk about that on, on uh, Thursday. Thursday. Wayne, Thursday. Scattering. Thursday. Okay, you're on. Wednesday. Lecture Wednesday. Scattering lab Thursday. Distinct scattering property. So they're going to have like. Cool um, properties of scattering that will help you distinguish them with water. All right. So, this 
So the flip side of that was um, designed by Heidi Stassi-Grimbal, but also another F3. And it started with a desert top flow cytometer, which um, were originally used for blood cell analysis. They're not analyzing individual parts of blood cells. And so they modified it. And they have this pretty cool, anyway, they have this pretty cool um, way of looking at particles. So they focus cells so that they go through an interrogation section of the instrument single file. So they do it two ways. They do it hydrodynamically, which means that the sample is injected and it's injected into a sheet fluid. So it's like in the core, core of sheet fluid. And so that fluid is flowing very quickly and it tends to line the cells up one after the other. But they find sometimes in bigger cells that's more challenging. And so now they do something with this acoustic focusing and they don't understand very well, but it's in the space. Um, and so these cells are lined up individually going through this optical interrogation area. And so that's down here. So here's one cell coming through right here. Okay. It's flowing through. And we're going to take a cross section through that. So if we took a cross section through this section here, we could see a, um, the shape fluid, and then you could see the sample fluid in the center of it. Okay. And there's a cell in the sample coming through in this direction, flowing this way, right, into the wall. And so then they have a bunch of detectors sitting around. So there might be a detector here, here, and maybe around the back. So looking at it through the cross section, you can see the detectors around that cross section. Is everyone seeing that orientation like that there? Okay. So they shine a laser beam on that sample and the cell will interact with that laser beam. Part of it will be scattered forward. And honestly, you know, that scattering off of that particle, right, it might be coming at some angle. So it, better, it, it matters, you know, how that scattering is occurring. But so there'll be some fractions scattered in the forward direction, some scattered in the side direction. And the difference between forward and side scattering is going to tell you a lot about that particle. Find out later this week. And then they have a third detector. And I changed the color of my cell because it absorbed blue light and it emitted red light, it fluoresced. And so it measures the fluorescence coming off of that cell also. And so they have the filter here, so they only measure the cell. So that is basically a standard flow cytometer that they've modified for pilot. And so you can measure every single cell. Yeah. All right, so fluorescence detectors on the one that will be this one. Yeah. So it's detecting blue scattered light, red scatter, blue scattered forward light, blue side scattered light, and then red fluorescence at an angle, right? And sometimes they have two flip fluorescent sensors. So one could be orange and one could be red. So you could look at chlorophyll fluorescence or phyco phycoerythmic fluorescence. All right, so they took that and designed it so that you could put it in a can and put it in the ocean, right? So that was one of the very early um, in situ flow cytometers or flow cytobots. Um, and so they, you know, they had optimized the cytoplankton, not blood cells, made it immersible in such condition. So then the next step in this development was to um, use the signal that they're measuring, either fluorescence or scattering, to trigger a camera. So every cell that goes through, you can detect it either by its scattering or its fluorescence, and it will trigger um, a camera to capture a picture. So it's a flashlight, it's a little bit downstream. There's a flashlight that will shine on that 
on that particular cell that will go to the camera and they will reflect an image. So you can trigger it on scattering, which means you'll get to pick up every particle. If you have a lot of particles in the water, like detritus and fecal pellets and junk, you get an image of each one of them. So say if you're interested in carbon, you might want to do that when you're doing carbon and detritus. If you're interested in phytoplankton, you have to trigger on fluorescence. So you would only see those particles that absorb blue light and emit red light. Might still get some people tell us because they if they still have chlorophyll and they don't still for us. Fluorescing poo, right? You can have a whole thesis on fluorescing poo. So then you capture, now you have an image of every every particle or every cell. What are you gonna do with it? <laughs> it's a lot of data, right? So they're collecting up their they're injecting about five mil sample. They're seeing most of the particles in there. You can actually calculate the volume. There's a little bit less than five um, mils, or about you know, two and a half, four mils, depending on the particles. You've got an image of every single particle. You've got an every single size on there. You need to go through and manually like, look at all. No, you can develop a classifier. Okay. So here are some of the images. So for those of you who are excited to play that you see a queen and a high for gorgeous. You can see like the core class. So anyway, you'll get to see all of these. It's really not so that's my favorite one. It's like a little chain of shovels. Right? <laughs> this is still um getting ready to divide. I think this is left of cylinders, rise of selenia. So uh, here's the chaucers, you can see all of its spines. I mean, it sounds like the flow is in sheep fluid. It sounds like a really hard thing. These, these diatoms come through and their um, structures are not broken. When you think of their fragile silk so, so, I mean, it's pretty impressive. So um, what they need to do is for each one of these images, well, they still do they um, have the original image, and then they start going through a series of, you know, phase conversions. You can see the outlines of all the features. Then they look for edge, they do edge detection. They do a blob image where they can sort of look at the darker parts. And then through some cool analysis. And then you can also combine this with, you know, its fluorescence properties and its scattering properties. They calculate something like 267 geometric and optical features of each cell. And then using that in machine um, learning uh, to identify the classified. You can't classify everything in the species level, some things you can do in the species level. But you know, things look like to be by eye, they're going to look like to the classifier. But here's an example of the classifier identification versus manual identification. And you can see that, you know, it does a really good job. The little red box here is the classifier both by hand and automated um, equally. So since then, they now use a convoluted neural network approach um, using features. And you can look at this. And a lot of people are not looking at this. When you look at anybody's meetings, you can see the other classifier that they're using because they might be really, really interested in the alveolar because they're toxic, or they might be really, really interested in diatoms and they have all the diatoms completely classified. So the classification matters in terms of how you go from an image to breathing water. So just make sure you're very clear on who developed the classifier and which one you're doing for. So every 20 minutes, you can get an Excel spreadsheet of all of the cells and its classification without looking under a microscope. All right, so the data are all shared on a dashboard. This is um, mine. 
So we can see the dot where mine is located. This happens to be, I don't know why this is so funky, it looks really nice on my screen. Um, this happens to be from 2023. This is January 11th. So that's just the image that I pulled off. I have a whole time series from when I first got it. I did a lot of work in the lab and then it just got deployed. The gaps are often when I have a new field on the chip. Um, but there's a lot of data and the amount, this is essentially the number of um, images that it sees. So it gives you a, a little bit of a sense of what the file volume is. So that's a bloom, that's a bloom, that's a bloom. These are the images, the first page. So the first page of bioplankton, this one happens to have seven pages. So there's seven pages associated with one sample. So let's look at, okay. So let's take off this one. If you click on it on the website, it'll show you the image of the image of the image gives you a scale bar. You can tell how big they are relative to each other. You can do another fact. You got it in the picture? Oh, this is deadly fun. What do you think? It's a diagram. You have to put your hands in the diagram. It looks like little boxes. Okay, diatoms are silica cell walls, they fit together. Um, it looks like a little pill box next to another little pill box like that. It slides together. Um, this one happens to be collected by these little silica um, frustules. The frustules are the box. The, when they're connected, what's it called? It's not, it's not CETA. I can't remember what it is. It said the CETA are really warm. Yeah. I don't know what they call it, the ones that collect oh, cells. Okay. 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 I'll answer our question. Um, you'll also see, you know, you can actually see dividing cells in some of these images. That's really quite nice. Um, there's the size. Okay. So then you go to this um, uh, the GitHub site, and and Heidi has put together, you know, some pretty nice examples of IFCD images for different groups. So these are ciliates, they're grazers. And so I pulled up the part that was diatoms, which is right here. You click on that. And I went through and I looked and I was like, hey, now, looks like that one. Looks like a Thalassia cyra. So I would guess that it's a Thalassia cyra. I don't even know what Thalassia cyra looks like. But you can just kind of take a glance and look through all of them see which one it looks like to you. Then you can check out the automated classification. So if you go back to the web page, there's going to be something called auto class here. You can click on it. It's just an Excel spreadsheet for that sample. I opened it up in Excel. And what you get is the image number, which gives you, if you look at this, it's like the date, Year, month, day, and then a T, hour, minute, second. And then the under bar is the number, the image number. So this sample is like 3,500 at least different images. So I looked at this number. So I knew what to look for. And I found it right here. Right, that's 3,000. 469. Across the top are all the species that it can classify, or, or taxonomic groups, not species, but taxonomic groups. And the values that you see here are probabilities that that image is that classification. And you see the numbers are really small, except when they're not. This one is no doubt <laughs> the less et cetera. But you can, what's, what's interesting is to look at this automated classification and think about why is it, why are there a couple of groups that it seems to be associated with? And then you go and you look at those groups, you're like, oh, because they look the same, right? 
And so if you can't do it under a microscope, this isn't magic. Right, it's kind of as good as you are. It looks like this shape, it has this like optical density, it's a five point two up on it might be this guy, Tom. So, anyway, um, using the probabilities helps you, you know, establish some uncertainty in your classification. All right, there's a lot of small stuff in here, too. I showed you the front page of all the pretty big diatoms and kids out of lab. It's the, the couple of pages in them are getting smaller and smaller. And so, you know, I, mean, I happen to know that that little thing that tapered it when I think it was like a little sperm, but anyway, it's a cryptomonad. And this long, thin thing I've identified, I know that that's a penny diatom. It looks like a flying saucer that's blurry. Definitely a penny diatom. Um, but they're small, right? So here's your challenge. We're going to break you into six groups. And so I think all of so the group should have three, one group. Four. Each group is going to get the seven pages of images for one sample. And I basically, I should have said July, June, because we're going to be up, we were going into July today. So December through June, you're each going to get a month, one day at a month. And um, you're going to cut out the different phytoplankton for your sample and group them into like looking classes. Okay, so if I went back to this page, you might say, well, that one looks like that one looks like that one and that one. And so you're going to put all those into a pot and then you'll figure out who it is. And they have left us alone. Um, it'll be like, well, here's a bunch with spines and spines. I'm going to put all those together. Definitely, I'll be able to identify if I see another one of those. This one looks like, oh, here's that and that. Right? So you're just going to put them together. Okay? You're doing a classification by hand. But you appreciate this. A lot of work. Right? And then you're going to make this group. So, um, I'm going to just figure out how pasted values, which are sort of like file volume, because the bigger cells have bigger images, the smaller cells have smaller images. And um, you're going to make sure that you're all looking at the same groups. You all have the same values on your Instagram. So, these are the specifics. We'll go through that in a second. But essentially, you're going to have a sticky giant um, that has a grid on it. It gets started in this way. And you want to get the name on the wall over there. And across the bottom, each square represents. So when you paste the images on here, it'll end up being bottom bottom. You'll be able to compare a different species or types of groups that are showing up in December, December, January, February, right off the dot here. So you get a sense of the water throughout the year. And if you work your way through things next slowly, you can think about what the optical properties probably look like. It's different modes. Okay, different sizes, different patients. And so sticky part is at the top, make sure you orient it so you know you can't put tape on the wall. You can put tape on the wall. So you'll paste your resins in the medium because they tend to be the big cells that you're gonna see. And maybe you only have one of these, and it's not a eucampia. Know who that one is? I've been looking it up, but they're in the water now, which is crazy, and I don't know what they're doing. They're gorgeous. A lot of elliptic cylinders, a lot of phosphorus. Maybe you want to put all your diatoms here and all your dinoflagellates here. I don't know, but just make sure you're all doing it the same way. And then there's nanoplankton. Like you are not cutting those out individually; you're cutting out strip. Okay. 
only head up the things that like you know that you can really separate. But when you start to get really tiny things, just press through them. You know, they're gonna have a lot of things. And good luck. You know, the weather is awesome. <laughs> You would do that when I put you a You're not, let's just see the check. Like, I don't think you're going to this. I'm going to figure out what the image number is. I want to see what they classify it as. If you're interested, but you don't have to do that. So, what I, so whatever, whatever has the highest probability. But if it's in a lot of groups, that's not very similar. So, you would want to type them in. In that probability and propagate that you know, going to do some, um, you know, and sort of on the what's the word I'm looking for when you want to appear into a diversity index and you were not very certain the probabilities are really wide, you want to ask there. Yeah. It's not really a probability, okay. Modify, yeah. Probability. Yeah. yeah, this probability will give you some other more confidence. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's not as confident as a probability. All right, so I'm going to leave this up here. This part kind of help you think about how to do it. And so you might have a sample, like you might have leftist cylinders in your sample, and you might not, but you still need to have a space for leftist cylinder, and you just don't have anything there. So you're going to have to agree a little bit once you figure out who your groups are. Wander around and look at everybody else's cutouts and be like, well, how the order we put it? Right? And then when you hang them from December through July on that back wall, you'll be able to see who had, which, which bloom had the most biomass. Was it nanoplankton? Was it, you know, Galassia cyro, whatever it was? And it just kind of gives you a sense of diversity of plankton. And a better appreciation for why there's so much variability on the properties, right? Okay, one group is February, and February is the lowest biomass. They only had three sheets to cut and paste. So, they need to go and help other but some groups have nine. Some people have to. I try to make it really easy, but it's hard for us to waste much time. So, what you've got are which group gets a packet? The pages. Okay. Each group gets a sticky note. And up. up. I have 12 pairs of scissors I bought out of staple, so this is it. I'm not too sure. <laughs> I recommend using the, the case, but if you happen to be doing it, I'm trying to pay for the cost of the box. I have a bunch of dry rubbers, so if you want to draw out the seat, but it might be better than just like writing it and then moving it across the box. I feel like there's way too many taxonomic groups that you want to separate. Is that your assignment? Learn something that's better for you. Okay. Don't get hung up on little things, right? Like, what are like we're trying to see? Is it big stuff? Is it small stuff? Is it both of them? Is it giant plasmas? You know, um, I just have one student who's got every single one out. And I'll study my hands. I was like, wow, hold on. There's <laughs> a lot more work to do this next month. Generalize. Right? Yeah. I just have a question about the eyes. Yeah. On what side of the menu is it? So it can detect, a, I mean, it, it could, just, you can't see it too much from far from the but it's a dot. Okay. Right? You can't classify it. Really, the meat, unless it's a penny, you can't classify the meat about eight microns. <laughs> and then there's a few folks that are hard to see. Why do you need to see the dog? Why do you need to see the dog? You'll see some strong videos or the four digits. 